morning, Gary Khan, virtual Gary Khan, the very first one. I want to give a huge thank you to everyone behind the scenes who have made this amazing. I mean, can you believe it? Within two weeks, they were boom, bang, boom, tabletop events. Thank you. Um, Jimmy from Wizards of the Couch is hosting this. Thank you so much. You've worked so very hard. Um, yes, thank you all. And um, yeah, this is remarkable. Welcome to Women in Gaming. I'm Satine Phoenix. I'll be your host. And we have an amazing crew with us today to talk about their experiences in storytelling. Megan, why don't you start and introduce yourself first? Hi, I'm Dr. Megan Connell. I'm a board certified psychologist out of Charlotte, North Carolina. I am also a uh, dungeon master for a live stream show called Clinical Role, where all of my players are other therapeutic dungeon masters and psychologists. Uh, and I do a show on YouTube called Psychology at the Table, where I give tips to dungeon masters who have friends who might be struggling with anxiety or depression or other challenges around the table. Thank you. Kaylee? Hi, I'm Kaylee Bray. I am the game master for Damsel's Dice and Everything Nice, the princess RPG. And I float around the internet doing other gaming. You're things. writing. Yes. You're writing I'm, a blog. Yes, I'm also the uh, RPG contributor for Girls Game Shelf. That's super Thanks. important. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Elisa. Hi there, I'm Elisa Teague. I am primarily a board and card game designer, but I am also an RPG author. I do a lot of work for Dungeons and Dragons and other uh, RPGs. I have a brand new 5e compatible campaign setting coming out hopefully next month. Uh, things are a little in flux because of the world situation right now, but it's called Wardlings and it's based on the WizKids miniature line of Wardlings and that's coming out soon. And I also am a dungeon master. I do work at different conventions and D&D in a castle and different events all around the world. And an amazing uh, puzzle master. Yes, puzzle I'm mistress. also a puzzle designer. I, you know, I have a long list of stuff that I do. So I try to condense it when I'm introducing myself. But yes, I am also a puzzle designer for uh, escape rooms. I've done some printed work and I do puzzles for... RPGs like Dungeons and Dragons. Yay! Uh, Kelly. Hey, uh, I am day job and life job, I guess, in some ways. Uh, I am a television and film and comedy writer. I write musical theater. Uh, you'll see some of my stuff, mostly stuff on TBS and Adult Swim right now, uh, but more to come. But I also play a lot of D&D. &D. Uh, I'm uh, the dungeon master for Girls Gets Glory, which you can check us out. We'll actually be doing uh, Lost Odyssey next week as well, so it's exciting to have the team back together. Um, and I also, of course, am on Sirens, the teen Sirens we played yesterday, which was super fun. Uh, <laughs> and that's kind of my bread and butter in terms of the at world. Thank you, Alice. Um, hi, I'm Alice Cleaver. Um, I'm also White Rabbit Pick um, on Twitter and all forms of social media. Um, I am the other half of the Scratchicus Academy, where we like to introduce people to TTRPGs and get people playing and learning how to do it. Um, I'm a DM for other channels as well as a player, and I'm also a photographer. Um, I often forget to say, but I am. An amazing photographer, absolutely. <laughs> so the thing that we do best is tell stories, and it's all about communication. It sounds like everything that you guys, you ladies do, um, is about um, expressing your uh, your ideas through different types of storytelling, TV, games, even through therapy. So why don't we tell everyone a story? Well, this will be a story time with all of us. How did you get into the field that you're in as it relates to story and such? So let's pick, oh, I've got dice. I've got dice. <laughs> okay. Yes, roll of the dice. <laughs> all right, roll the dice. And this is gonna be loud, sorry. Uh, one, two, three, four. Kelly. Oh, hey, so I can start? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so a story in, in terms of my journey kind of bringing me yeah. to where I am. So uh, like most people, uh, I was a loser uh, in high school. Hey, uh, <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, I, I mean, maybe you weren't, but I like to consider most people that, that in that category. Um, I, I, I really, it was hard for me growing up because uh, I, I always felt like my, I was smart. Uh, I was straight A's, head of my class, was just really, I had a high 
computing processing system up here. So it was just information was really coming in. And that wasn't really something in terms of my environment that was celebrated. So instead of, you know, trying to fight against it, I just kind of internalized a lot of it and just sat around and would watch and uh, observe. I was surprisingly quiet. Uh, most of my high school experience, which it's funny when people know me nowadays, I'm probably the loudest person you'll meet. Um, but that led to me really having this craving, this observational sort of need to process everything and then regurgic, like regurgitate it through my own personal lens. And story was something I latched onto, especially big worlds that were magical. That's why I love musical theater so much. But musical theater, surprisingly, one day after practice rehearsal with community theater, I had uh, one of my friends who was who was gay at the time and the, the culture and the environment I was in that wasn't really celebrated. But he kind of whispered to me, he goes, hey, you, uh, you want to do something crazy? And I'm like, I'm already friends with a bunch of gay people. This is already a problem for my mother, who <laughs> at the time was very, very, very Catholic. Um, and I, I said, what, what are we going to do? Like, let's, let's be real edgy. What, what do you want to do? And he's like, I want to be your dungeon master and play D and D. And I was like, oh my gosh, let's do it. So my first table was, uh, four of my closest gay friends and me, uh, who at the time was still figuring all of that out, but it was just a magical table full of like the most punk kids in the world sitting around saying, sticking it to the man, rolling dice, but it was the most magical, um, an environment and experience. And I was about 15, 14. I was a freshman in high school at the time. And I just needed it from that point on. So I begged people all the time to play with me. And nobody said yes through most of high school into uh, college. But uh, I found it where I could in little corners. And eventually that led to me kind of, and eventually when D&D &D became a little bit more of a conversational piece out here within the last six, six seven years, I uh, started to just scream about it. And then people started to say, I've always been curious. And the next thing you know, uh, I started running games. I've been playing one with Kaylee almost every Wednesday for five years now. Um, yeah, we started in like 2015. <laughs> uh, and it's just been a magical journey since. Wow. So as it relates to um, what you do for a living, which is writing, how do you incorporate it? Uh, do you incorporate gaming into your writing? Do you, is there a back and forth at all? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think that when you're playing any sort of RPG game and it's freeing up the catacombs of, of your mind that maybe you're not even you're not even walking into yet. It's like, for example, you might be drawing from people you met 20 years ago, your source of inspiration for like an NPC. You might be pulling from a place you visited with your family and describing the swamps of Florida when you went on a family vacation. I feel that when you're writing TV film, you're pulling from those places and you're drawing from them and RPGs just like unlock those doors so much easier than having to just hack away at them and pull and draw and force yourself kind of through that writer's block. I think that it creates an improvisational, heavy sort of dance in your mind. Awesome. For the rest of you writers that on the panel, um, do you relate to this in any way? Absolutely. Yeah. I see Kaylee mobbing her head. <laughs> yeah. So why don't you talk yeah. about um, your experiences? Mine? Yeah. Uh, Primarily as a as an actor and starting my my creative journey as it was always like performing was the thing and I was really lucky to have that encouraged by my mother and having a younger sibling to force to do whatever plays you made up or whatever as a kid is very helpful. <laughs> um, and then starting specialized acting training very, very young and feeling like you needed to be boxed in and only be an actor since I was like 13, but also getting to be the weird kid at a specialized art school program and meeting all of the other weirdos among weirdos. Dungeons and Dragons was the thing that let me explore all of my other forms of creativity. Because as an actor, a lot of times you forget that 
you're collecting characters and personalities just like writers do. You have to build these huge backstories for everything that you're experiencing and use your imagination so specifically that limiting yourself to just one element of performing isn't always super helpful. And so getting to stretch those muscles in muscles Dungeons and Dragons was kind of the dream. And I was really lucky. I also found my group of super alt kids when I was a teenager who was just like, hey, you, you want to do something crazy? How much crazy can we get? <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons in the library at boarding school. <laughs> and uh, we played for two years. And I was really lucky. Like, I, I, it was... I think like six or seven years before I played at a table with a um, white male DM. Huh. <laughs> I always had just a really interesting group of, of gaming friends and I having those perspectives I think is really, really, really helpful. So you went to Juilliard, right? <laughs> is that what I remember? Yes, Did you I game to... with other actors at Juilliard? I did. I actually had to teach... <laughs> a class on how to play Dungeons and Dragons once at Juilliard. <laughs> Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it was um, <laughs> really bizarre. We all had to teach something that we were an expert in that nobody else in the class was. So I ran a game for 17 people. Nice. <laughs> in two hours. Uh, while also teaching them how to build a character and play the game. Uh, so it was a really, I basically just gave them like a little bit of dungeon crawl and a little bit of combat and showed them what dice were. But there are, yeah, there are a group of Tony award winning, very well-established <laughs> actors who learned how to play Dungeons and Dragons from me. And that will always be my claim to fame. It's <laughs> awesome. Teaching is such an interesting way to explore storytelling and mm -hmm. even game design. Having to teach people makes you double back and realize, oh, this is how things function and this is a better way to do it, which is why we all play test. Elisa, why don't you talk a little bit about your experiences and where you came from? Where did I come from? Well, um, well, of course, now that I'm starting to talk, I have a little thing. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Um, I was very fortunate growing up. I had um, parents that were throwing everything fantasy and game related at me um, from the time I was a little kid. And I grew up during the time of the satanic panic for Dungeons and Dragons, but I went to a Jewish private school and um, I remember my, my parents talking about the fact that, and the school itself, talking about the fact that, you know, the Israeli army was using Dungeons and Dragons as a team building exercise and for good communication and everything. And so uh, my school was like all for it. Like I, I got to avoid all of that <laughs> stuff where my parents, you know, where I had to my, for my parents, a lot of my friends, you know, you know, outside of, of when I was growing up in junior high school and, and starting to play, um, uh, everybody else had to like hide their books or hide the fact that they were playing from everybody. So for me, it wasn't that big of a deal. And I actually got my first books. Um, my older brother had them. I don't remember him ever playing. Um, I think he just had them and then he was getting rid of them. And I got them before he you know, was able to throw them away. And I started reading them. I'm like, what is this? And, um, you know, I wanted to play when I was much younger, but, you know, when I was about 12 years old, 13 really is when I started learning how to play. But then that's when I started becoming like super goth kid, which I was telling these ladies before when we were setting up that in high school, I was like super gothy. And so I started playing a lot of like cyberpunk 2020 because I wanted like, I had the clothes and, you know, like I had made my own little like eye thing and <laughs> I totally looked so okay. but at the time, you know, it was the thing to do. And so I played a lot of role playing games just to like act out my like deepest fantasies. And I wanted to be a writer so badly during that time. Like my biggest dream, you know, based on how I was raised was being a fantasy author. And that's what I thought I was going to do. And the only thing that my dad 
um, did to kind of crush that whole thing was tell me that I had to be a writer on the side because I'd never make any money being a writer. I had to be a doctor. Uh, (laughs) But but he still encouraged the creative aspects of my personality and what I wanted to do. And I found myself after high school, um, I went to fashion design school and I learned all about manufacturing. And uh, I found myself after being in the fashion world for a few years in the tabletop game industry doing production and manufacturing and then slowly moving into the design and development phase of that. And it's only been a few years now that I've been on the RPG side of things as well um, because I do both now. And I am now writing so much fantasy (laughs) that I ended up being a fantasy author after all. But Yay! <laughs> yeah, I got to, I got to live the dream and do all the things that I love to do. Actually, I'm very very fortunate, um, and I'm also fortunate that I've had like a core group of friends um, and D and D players that I've been playing with for basically ever. My group that I'm I'm playing both D and D and um, a Savage World Deadlands game right now. I've been playing with them for well over 20 years. Um, the same people um and which is amazing to me and for a long time i was playing star wars saga edition rpg and with those guys i was playing you know like a, there was one campaign that was three years long um and then we followed it up with another campaign that we kind of like made a steampunk version of on our own and uh, we played that for a couple of years and i've had such a great opportunity to form long-term stories with these people that I will remember forever. Um, it's like a part of my own life. So yeah. What a fun journey. Yeah. That's so cool. Doing the thing that you love and being creative and getting to do that is just, uh, we'll talk about permission next um, after everyone expresses uh, their histories. Alice, photographer extraordinaire, dungeon mistress extraordinaire. Why don't you tell us where you came from? I had never heard of Dungeons and Dragons. My parents don't know what Dungeons and Dragons is. My friends didn't know what it was either. I actually discovered not that long ago. um, I picked up um, a 2.5e monster manual when I was six at a moving house sale for my art class because I liked the art in it. So I had the book for a very long time and I didn't really... I picked it up when I was about six or seven and I loved the artwork in it and I, I knew it was a game but no one would play with me <laughs> because no one knew what it was. Um, it actually uh, came up to the point where I met my husband and I, we would play games like um, Hero Quest and Dungeon Quest and we put like the role play um, side into it. Um, I, I have dyslexia. I went to a dyslexia um, specialist school um, growing up and I love to write but I am so bad at it (laughs) like it's one of those things where I just can't process what's in my head and put it on paper it's a real struggle for me um but by coming into D&D and TTRPGs I only had to say it I didn't have to I didn't have to write it down I didn't have to have someone to read it and check it and go through it I could describe everything I did and I've only actually played IRL, I think I have one game, two or three games, <laughs> otherwise everything else has been online. Um, I had almost, I, I guess probably not the best experience IRL, which was one of my first ones. Um, and we also, at the time, lived in the middle of nowhere. Um, oh yeah, where actually... are you, by the way? Because this is the most phenomenal thing about what we're doing virtually. Where are you yeah. located? Um, at the moment, we're in the UK. We're up north in the middle of a teeny tiny little village. Um, I do work on American time. So I woke up not too long ago after a very a late night session last night. Um, but yeah, there's, there, there was no one around who would play D&D apart from at the time my husband worked as an engineer, literally put a sign up at work and said, come play D&D, Alice will feed you. <laughs> and that was how we managed to play the first proper game. Um, and as people moved away, we were like, well, there's loads of people online. We've got friends in Sweden. We've got friends in America. Let's just gather together and do 
that and there were we were all learning at the time um and we just sort of built the academy because so many people were like well i want to learn how do you play that i can't find a group because i live in the middle of nowhere and stuff like that so in a way i think i was thrown into the deep end especially with dming very early on um i'm actually a more confident as a dm than i am a player which i know is probably a bit of a mix around um but yeah, all of our stuff was online because we couldn't find anyone in our area that played. So instead we just sort of reached out to everyone overseas because we couldn't find anyone. So. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. You guys have been at this for over two years now, right? Yeah, it's uh, just past two years, I believe. So Congratulations. Yeah, and it's really beautiful you. because you've been you've gone virtual for the over two years. And so being able to communicate with people overseas and through different time zones is natural for you. Um, Megan. It wasn't at first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you were a leader in getting the world used to it. You know, people got to see from all over the world, you um, reach out to people and they're like, oh, if they can do it, we can do it too. And that's the whole thing is... Um, visibility. You guys mm. made yourselves visible and now other people are very comfortable with gaming uh, mm. globally. This is Nika. I would like to introduce my cat Nika. Who's <laughs> going to be on next to me. Um, but it's really important. Community is important. Mm -hmm. Communication is important. You know, people are in different places, some metropolitan and some very secluded. Megan, what you do for a living, uh, let's talk a little bit about that and uh, gaming and communication. Yeah, I I came into being a therapeutic dungeon master through my own playing of D and D. So we played a home game. We played through the Lost Minds of Fandelver, and I had a druid character. And then um, we found because I'm a parent, and uh, having a face to face group when you had uh, at the time a one year old and a like eight month or two or three month old it just was not possible. Uh, so we found a group on Roll Twenty, and we've actually been playing weekly since. January of 2017, I think. Uh, same campaign. We're getting ready to wrap it up here in the next couple of months, which is really exciting. Um, but I was thinking one day about the, what my characters had in common, um, because I made a very different character for that campaign from the home campaign. And uh, when I thought about it, I was thinking through that with that psychological lens, um, I realized something about myself and realized that both of these characters, even though they were very different, were people who didn't fit in and were their main thing was they were trying to find where they fit in. And I realized that was me. That was what I was trying to do in my own life. And I also realized like that probably would have taken years and years of therapy to finally like un unveil because like I was so well hidden within myself. And so I knew I wanted to use it as a therapy tool. And so I learned um, kind of serendipitously that week on Dragon Talk, uh, Dr. Boca Mazzaro from Take This was on talking about how in Seattle they were using D&D therapeutically. And so he and I connected and um, have since become very good friends. We do trainings now on training other psychologists and therapists on how to use tabletop role-playing games therapeutically. Dr. B. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a, um, I get to run now. I'm running three groups right now um, because of everything that's going on in the world. We have actually switched to online. So sort of full circle, I guess I'm now running games, uh, you know, half through Roll20, half through Zoom uh, to, uh, you know, my clients who are playing these, you know, heroes going out and trying to save the world in a world that feels kind of out of control right now, which I think is helpful for all of them. Um, how hard it is, is it to make that transition from, uh, you know, doing everything with your clients uh, in person and then virtually? It's surprisingly not as hard as you would think, which is a really good news. So I guess a quick PSA to anybody who's been doing therapy and now feels like they can't because they can't go into the office and their therapist is doing it uh, through teletherapy. It's amazing the genuine connection that you can have still through video conferencing and through just talking and having that connection and having that time is still really sacred and so even though it's different it's not less valuable um and i think for the groups in many ways it's been just as valuable to be like i've been isolated i can't see anybody and here's my group 
here's my campaigning party and we're finally back together and this feels so awesome and we can still go out and save the world even though we're all stuck at home you know trying to figure out what to do next and it's really interesting because storytelling is a very um uh solitude what's the word i'm looking for a uh, very lonely life right? Because you spend mm -hmm. a lot of time by yourself. And yet it's not lonely because you got all this stuff happening in your head. But gaming allows you to do both of those things, get your healthy social interactions and tell the stories that are deep inside you that you have to tell. Let's talk a little bit about permission. So um, in my experience, and this is not just for women, this is for everybody. We're all very creative people. A lot of us are creative people, but not a lot of us give ourselves permission to t make that leap what was it in your lives that was that gave you that this is what i'm supposed to do i'm not going to be a doctor i'm not going to go and work in an office this is the thing that i'm going to do and um, i'm going to give you permission for instance i had a very spiritual experience where i just knew right then and there my purpose is communication and that is what i need to do i need to gather um, humans and put them in a place and make them and share them with the world. I don't know why it's, it just happened. I didn't expect it, but um, there was a very specific moment uh, for me. So was there something like that for all of you? And this is a free for all. So you guys can jump in as you like, um, respond to one another if you'd like. I think for me, um, I have this weird tendency to, well, first of all, I have a lot of anxiety. I have anxiety talking in front of people and I do it all the time on my panels you know, at every single convention that I go to. Um, but when I first started, it was absolutely terrifying uh, for me to the point where I did get sick um, before going out onto like stage and things like that. And I, I think for me, as my career has progr progressed, I've challenged that anxiety. And I don't know if it's like some weird thing in my brain where I'm like, I don't know how to do a thing, but I'm going to say that I know how to do it. And then I'm going to do it just to like <laughs> myself that I can do it. And this is a thing that's in my daily life. Um, people will, you know, sorry, everybody, but I mean, I've performed, so that's good. Um, but uh, people come up to me and say, oh yeah, we, we, we're looking for somebody who can do this. And they're like, oh, I can do it. And then I don't know how to do it, but I learn how to do it. And then I kick ass at it. And um, yeah, I don't know. That's just the thing for me. So Every step of my career getting to this point has been me being deathly afraid and then facing that fear and just going for it. And I, I don't know, I am like the truest Aries that ever did Aries, I guess. <laughs> Is that consensus though? Because I feel like- Yes, yeah, Aries yes. are like that. I can, I am also an Aries. Happy almost birthday, everybody, or, or past. Oh recently. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I'm a Taurus Gemini and mm -hmm. I am, but I, I also am like that. Uh, if I don't know it, I figure it out. And that's like, that is the, for me, I think that's that, that line, that's the mm -hmm. line that you cross. Either you see that goal and you walk away from it. Cause you're like, I wasn't trained in that. Or you see it and you're like, we're going in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people always ask me like, how do you know how to do so much stuff? And it's like, well, I learn, you know, I, I, I pick a thing that I want to do and I do it. And then now I have that skill and now I'm great at that skill. And I think that if everybody went out and, you know, took every opportunity that they had to learn a new thing, even if you're afraid, um, you know, the sense of accomplishment, the sense of just growth within your own self is so amazing. Yeah. It's um, permissions interesting because I, I mean, philosophically in terms and relations to somebody else, permissions and necessity, but in, terms of permission for yourself, um, I think it changes the conversation a little bit, especially when it's something that is going to generate such beautiful things. When you when there's something within you that instead you're you're looking for this permission. Cause it, it, especially for me, uh, in terms of my writing career very specifically, I was out here searching for permission. I took eight, nine internships, 10 internships. I worked everywhere. I was constantly waiting for somebody to validate me in their eyes to say, oh, no, 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 you're a writer and you're good. But after years of being out here, trying to find an assistant job, um, trying to find a good coordinator job, trying to move up in this sort of expectation of permission, I woke up one day and I said, I don't need anybody. I need myself. I need to give myself 
that validation and that permission because the moment that I tell people I'm a writer instead of I want to be a writer, they're going to listen. So I think that, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, we all have to work through that in our own ways. And especially when you are on the other side of the conversation for so long and you don't know what it feels like to grant yourself permission. It's a very weird space to be in. And I think that thankfully, uh, storytelling has given me that ability as well. I didn't wait for somebody to tell me to be a DM. A bunch of people needed a DM and I said, I'm the DM. (laughs) That's right. That's how you do it. (laughs) Yeah. That makes me think of the acting process too, because as an actor, especially, you are literally always asking permission to work. You can't, like, you're always given this expectation that you can't do your job until someone says, here's something I have written and a director and equipment and all of this stuff for you to do your job. And it's so competitive and everybody thinks that they can do it. So suddenly having to be, and being in that part of the world for so long of being like, well, I, I can't, this is my life and my passion and it's who I am. And I can't, I, my job is to ask permission to do my job and be rejected constantly. It is so hard to live that way, (laughs) but I'm also really competitive. So when I suddenly have an idea and I'm like, oh, I, oh, that's a really good idea. And then you start to no one else has done it. And you're like, okay, well, but I'm, I'm not a writer. I'm not a producer. I, I have to find somebody to do this for me so that then I can be part of it so that nobody else gets to this idea first. And, and then that moment of, oh no, I, there's nobody else. There's just me. So that's it. I, that's all I have. So it's, I have to give myself permission to do that if I want to be the first person to do it. We That's are all one man thing. bands. We are all yes. one woman bands. We all do a million things. Yeah. And you almost well, have to. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll say for me, like one of the things in my journey that's a little different is with running this group for actual clients. Like I have to take in the code of ethics that I have to follow as a psychologist and looking through it and going like, by this code, do I have permission? to do this thing. And like one of the challenges we've had with using tabletop role-playing games as therapy is there's like basically no research done. And the research that has been done has been done poorly. Um, Like I I read a study and I'm reading through it. I'm like, okay, this seems good. This seems promising. And then they said like, okay, so we can basically assume that all people who play tabletop role-playing games also play World of Warcraft. And so are exactly the same as World of Warcraft players. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) It's like, okay, let's scrap this one. But like trying to do due diligence and figure out like, how can I sit down? And if like I ever ended up like having to defend myself for using this as therapy, how, like, what are the best practices and what does this look like? And doing research and consulting and talking and bringing case studies in. Um, And so it's been a lot of groundwork, but like, I have this weird personality of like, once I know something, I can't unknow it. And like, it's just like, if I know better with this thing, I don't have an excuse. And I know that playing these games makes people happy and it helps us learn about ourselves and to grow in ways that we just can't grow elsewhere and in most effectively and in a fun, connective way. And so like, I can't not use them therapeutically. Um, and so, you know, it's just like, I don't know. It's, I think you're talking about Satine, like that call of like, this is what I need to do with my life. And so it's answering that and giving yourself permission to do this and to try to find ways that are authentic and true and all of that good stuff. Our heroine's journey is a lot different than the hero's journey. You mm-hmm. know, we have different needs and we have different drives and our, the way that we pull and call our creativity just is a different way of thinking because of you know, the way the world is, but also how we're raised, how we're raised to think. It's so, this is like the coolest conversation. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you, ladies. I have to get used to that. (laughs) Um, Um, For me, it was more giving, as we said earlier, permission to yourself. And for me, it was giving permission to myself to do something creative. Um, Because, I mean, particularly where... um, 
I grew up and the people are surrounded by all wonderful people, but it was, you have to do something academic. If you don't achieve as an academic, you don't achieve. Um, almost all of my friends I grew up with, God bless them, they're doctors, they're nurses, they're scientists, so they're doing amazing stuff right now. But I felt so out of place because even my, bro my, my, my brother is like straight A student, um, that sort of uh, individual, and I was just barely passing. I could work all night on maths homework or English homework, and I would scrape past. But when it came to something creative, I could do it. And it, and it felt good. It was like a confidence thing that I could do it. And I still went to university and did a history degree because I was told <laughs> I needed to do something <laughs> academic. So I have, um, and the first time I've used that history degree is in TTRPG. Um, so I'm, I was self-taught photography. I never did a course. I was like, I love this so much. So I'm going to learn it. I haven't, I can't afford to go to on a course. I can't afford the gear. I can't or whatever. I will giving myself permission because I know I'm good at this. So I'll do it. And it's the same reason that uh, my husband and I are now doing the Academy. I sit there and I think I can tell stories and it took ages for me to accept that this is what I'm good at. So it's okay to have this as the thing you do. Um, don't get me wrong, loads of my friends and my family still don't get it. They still don't understand why it's a, you know, when I first did photography, it was like, oh, do you want to do that? Um, and then I was like, oh, and now I'm doing Dungeons and Dragons. And they're like, oh, let me go back to the photography. Like it was that, it was, it was a weird mix, but I was like, no, I can actually do this. So I'm going to give myself permission to be creative because I'm not academic. But it took me ages to understand that that was all right. It was okay to do the creative side and pursue it. And I'm so much happier now because of it, but it took ages for me to actually jump in and make it more of a thing than anything else, rather than going down the history teacher route, which is what I think a lot of them thought I was going to do. So. Yeah. yeah, giving yourself permission doesn't mean that the thing that you're doing is easy. It might actually be far more difficult than doing it what other people want you to do. But that struggle and that hard, it, it just is so much more satisfying on a deeper level, in my opinion. Okay, we're actually, wow, we only have 10-ish minutes left, 10, 15 minutes left. <laughs> I know, this has been so rich. I love it. Let's talk about your favorite games and why. Whoever wants to go first. I mean, D&D. &D. D D Dungeons and Dra Dragons. Is that the answer? Yeah, D &D. yeah, yeah. can we just answer that? Yeah. <laughs> At least I so, might have a different opinion. And this means like role-playing games or board games. I'm actually... I have like, a very yeah. hard time picking... A f I hate the word favorite because... I love all games, um, like right, I mean, sitting in my game room right now and I have over, you know, two, like I have no less than 1,800-ish games and probably hitting around 2,000 games. I haven't counted recently. Oh, um, aspirations. <laughs> games that like, it's hard to pick a game to play on a normal game night. Um, I usually leave it up to whoever's coming um, to game night to pick one. For role-playing games, my heart is, in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and I had been so focused. I mean, again, since I, you know, my teenage years, I explored a bunch of different ones, but for the last, you know, uh, 20 years or so, um, of my whole 30 years of playing role-playing games, I've been so focused on Dungeons and Dragons that it's really hard to get me out of Dungeons and Dragons. And now that I've been writing for some other, uh, systems, I've, seen how amazing they are as well. I'm in a really cool game right now, which is Savage Worlds. It's a Deadlands Noir themed game that's amazing. And I, and I play it, I don't DM it. And it's amazing to be a player in a new system and learn it. And I, I love that, but my heart is with Dungeons and Dragons for role playing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, well, let's actually dive into that since we all <laughs> are in consensus, role playing games are the thing. Um, yeah. Let's talk about mechanics because you're all dungeon masters. You understand game design. 
Um, what is it very specifically that you're attracted to in the mechanics world of these these games? For me, with D and D, at least, it's. Um, be- <sighs> I see my role as a dungeon master, especially with my therapeutic games, is because, you know, there's a few different things that I'm trying to do. Um, and one of them being is to get more women out there playing who understand D&D. And because D&D is the most played tabletop role-playing game, it's, you know, not the best. There is no best. It's whatever system you like. But like it, yeah, you know. <laughs> but it's the most played. It's the most accepted. And so if I want them to be able to go into any game store and find a game and find a group to play with, if they can walk in and know how to play D&D, understand advantage, disadvantage, ranged attacks versus melee attack, you know, and understand all of that stuff, they're going to be more confident and able to sit down and play and make more players and hopefully also make more DMs, which most of them have DM'd at this point too. So that's really nice. Um, but like, I think like the bones of D&D are the, it's the skeleton essentially that has inspired almost all the other role-playing games out there. And so if you understand D&D, you can very easily kind of adapt that rule set into the other gaming systems out there. I, I would also say that I, I really enjoy fifth edition. I think that uh, some of the earlier games, you know, th- there was mechanical games were kind of the, the go-to and when fifth came out and started to, you know, get inspired by all of these sort of hands on journeys, it suddenly became so personal and i think that's why i love the mechanics based in fifth edition because you just you get to play on the choices you make which make the game less about defeating the monsters which is an important thing but the monsters then had this ability to kind of transcend just the physical monster and i think that um that's what's been so enticing about it In, in terms of other games that i've enjoyed um i have yet to play it, but I've read through it like several times and I absolutely love it. But I, I funded Story Brewers Good Society, which is a Jane Austen RPG game <laughs> uh, made by some amazing creators based out of Australia. And the reason I'm intrigued by it is because a lot of the dice mechanics are just removed and it's so built around how other people choose to complicate your story. And I think that that collaborative story building, that collaborative world building, and that ownership of the game, that's what makes D&D so special is because it's kind of become the gate, the the entrance point for all these other sort of explorative RPGs. Yeah, I agree. I feel like Dungeons and Dragons, fifth edition, and I learned on three and a half, and I still kind of feel this way about that one. Um, It's a really good balance of of structure and it, inc- I, I'm the most creative when I have like a little bit of structure to hang on to. And I feel brave enough to then jump off and start doing my own thing. And I think that it gives you those little like training wheels to start. And then you can start really building something and it gives the group something to hang on to together and then make it their own. And it's a really forgiving system, in my opinion, to customize it to your group so that everybody is playing the kind of game that fits them the best. Yeah. Cool. I really, I'm just going to jump in. I really love, um, having played all the editions, I love the dungeon dive and just exploring the dungeon, but I also love strategy, which is something I don't play a lot, but I anymore, but I have incorporated, I try to incorporate it in my encounters. It depends on the game, uh, the group that I'm playing with, because some groups are, we want to role play and some groups are, we just really want to fight things and now, you know, send us waves of things to battle and different terrain and all that. And I just love the variety in this. Um, I've been playing, uh, Jennifer Kretschmer ran me through 10 candles. I don't know if you guys have played that. I love it because it gives you the game master, the storyteller permission to have your players add in. And it's so cooperative that way. And everyone knows they're going to die. Like that's not, it's so strange. You know you're going to die, but you still fight till the very end to try to live. Um, there's that. Um, yeah, I, I really like the different kinds of mechanics. And I, I, I'm finding now, um, I met, I, I hung out with uh, James D'Amato on the cruise, on Joko Cruise. Oh my goodness. He ran me through so many games, and now I have this hunger to play more games, more card games. Uh, he wrote one called Noisy. 
I don't know if you guys have seen that, but it's like mm-hmm. a voice actor card game where you put down uh, a card and it's like a druid, urban druid, but then you have um, attribute cards and you also have phrases. So whatever's played, you have to say it in that accent and then people can play more attributes on it, like a Scottish romantic urban druid. And then you have to do it. And then it's kind of like in that Cards Against Humanity way where you like the one person's the judge. And now I, I see that it's so fun. It's so playful. And I'm, again, I take from there and I incorporate, incorporate it into my games. And um, yeah, I do recommend playing other games. It, it's, I never thought I would say that, but it's real. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. You should do that virtually. Um, I'm, through. I'm working on a plan to do a bunch of different games virtually, especially right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm working on that plan right now, actually. Awesome. So um, to wrap up, I believe we have about five ish minutes left. Why don't we say our our GM tips? <laughs> right. Uh, we will start with Alice. Uh, GM tips and your Twitter name and twitter at the end uh, yeah um my gm tips um one of them is which has actually been stressed a lot throughout this anyway is communication um i cannot stress how important communication is in a game um between both uh i say both players and dm a dm is a player in my opinion you're all there to have fun um so it's always talk to your players, whether it's a scene that's going to come up or what kind of game you want to play. What do you, as, as a group, want to do? Let people have those epic moments. And like, when I say communication, we use the safety system and we found that allow people to really step outside of their comfort zone because they know they're safe. They know the communication is there, that if something does make them uncomfortable, that they maybe didn't even think of beforehand. They they know they can either step away or, you know, they, they know they're with people that can make everything okay and comfortable and just be themselves and play the game they want to play. Um, the other thing is I don't like uh, punishing or uh, for nat ones. I think nat ones on and um, failures and dice rolls are one of the best things in the world. I Roll love for failing. story. Exactly. Yeah. It's like it's a story uh, moment. It's a character development moment, and it can lead to some of the most epic moments I find in games. So, and that one is not a bad thing. So you don't have to make it a bad thing. Um, and one of the other things is let players have their moments. Let the DM have their moments as well, as a whole. There's nothing better for me as a DM is handing over the description to a player and me going, what does this look like? And letting them lose. You can see when they lose themselves in that moment and everyone has so much fun just playing is basically what I love. But anyway, I'm White Rabbit Pick. Um, on Twitter, I am the other half of the Scratchcast Academy, um, and as I said, photographer um, and DM and player. So, thank you for having me today. Thank you so much. All right, I'm just going to go around the, my screen, uh, Kelly. Oh, okay. Uh, well, um, it's funny. I love natural ones. I'm just yeah. like going off that. Uh, I milk them. I make them the most catastrophic, as catastrophic as a natural twenty, um, because that's life in my humblest perspective. And if you can't have the highs and learn from your failures, then for me personally, that's what I love so much about it. I love the struggle and I love people trying to overcome really tragic and beautiful things because that's life. Like if you lose a leg with a natural one, you lose the leg. What are you going to do about it? Um, Kaylee is face planted because that recently happened with somebody in my game. Um, like if it, if for me as a DM, it's it's about listening. And I think that's what makes it so en- engaging because I I play to, and this is maybe just, I, I think that a lot of people play this way, but I play to make other people happy oftentimes. It's not a self-satisfying thing here. It's not me trying to feed something. It's me trying to say, how can I make the world and people work together 
to build such something so beautiful with one another, something so singular, things that are that feel like we're going on adventures outside in our heads together, conquering these great, beautiful unknowns. So I, I personally think that the, the more you can listen and the more you can as a dungeon master work through any sort of projections that you might be doing at the table, the stronger your game will become in the end because you're all going to become better people. After every game, after every session, you should always walk away saying, gosh, that was cathartic or that was beautiful or that was fun or that was silly or that was epic, um, whatever it might be. So those are my my GM tips. Uh, I, my handle is at a year a wizard Kelly spelled phonetically correct in the style of Hagrid year Y E R a wizard <laughs> Kelly. Thank you. So I just like, I don't get when you say things that are super inspiring. I'm just like, yeah, yeah. Um, next Megan, sorry. All right. Uh, so my tips come from the things that have helped me grow the most as a game master. So the first is like, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Mistakes are how we learn. We screw things up, make mistakes, own it, grow, and move on. Like, I think that's one of the best things. I think to the point of like ta what Elisa was talking about with like leaning into what you're afraid of and doing things that you don't know, um, bring random stuff into your games. Uh, I, I'm, I struggle with anxiety. I've been very open about that. And so like as anxiety is that desire to control the uncontrollable. And so as a game master, that could look like I'm going to control everything in the game. And so if I can force myself to let go of control by bringing random elements into the game, uh, I think that's wonderful. I use um, uh, friends now with the, the company, uh, Gem Hammer and Sons, they make this thing. It's the Deck of Wonder. It's a hundred random things that can happen. Uh, it's wonderful stuff like it rains candy for five minutes or everybody's shoes filled with custard. Um, it's weird stuff that just kind of pushes you narratively. And I really love that. Um, bringing those elements into the game and it helps you kind of flex those um improv muscles and learn how to roll with things a little bit more and i think it makes you a more enjoyable game master as well um and then there's the final tip is focus on character growth when in your story look at like the character and where do they need to grow what's going to happen there and that's going to create i think a much more dynamic story that the players are more bought into and is going to be a lot of fun um and we could find me talking about all that stuff on twitter i'm at megan Sidey on twitter thank you all right we've got three minutes left kaylee uh so my gm tip it's very similar to everybody else's but it's steal from your players so listen to them find out what they're latching on to my favorite thing is not being afraid to transform a session or a campaign when a player says something or like oh is this what's going to happen and i'm like well, it wasn't, but it is now. That's awesome. <laughs> and uh, you can find me at Hoppa Barbarian on Twitter. Just released a new parody video. Go take a look. Uh, and you can find uh, The Princess Show at Dice and Nice everywhere. Dice and Nice. Thank nice. you. Elisa. Well, um, I want to build on what Kaylee just said. If, if you have the opportunity, if you're writing your own campaign or, or your own adventure and not just using a module, um, that if you can get your players to, I don't know what's going on with my voice today, sorry. <clears throat> if you get, can get your players um, to get some brief backstories, building those backstories into something that's going to happen way in the future in your campaign is always a really nice surprise that makes a connection with your players. And I always try to do that. I also um, think that it's really important to not let rules, arguments, or anything else really hang up the flow of your game. So um, kind of like what Megan was saying, where it's like, oh, it's, you know, you might make a mistake or whatever. In my opinion, uh, DMs don't make mistakes. Uh, whatever the DM says should go. And unless it's like a, a, a really huge thing where I would say, you know what, when on our next bio break or, you know, between games, we can discuss this further. But for right now, this is what happens. And just keep going with it. Because whenever there's a lull, whenever there's a stall, when people have to like sit and look things up, it really breaks the flow of the game. And I think that's really important that you don't want to people to like lose their immersion in the story itself. I'm trying to go fast because I know we're running out of time. And that's the same how I feel about like railroading players. I know if you're, if you're running modules at a convention, you have a short amount of time, like we do with this panel, you have to like really focus on what the goals of the module are to get done. But if you have the luxury of playing at home or running a module at home or your own story, 
let your players explore. You can always get to that, you know, in that they're trying to get to next week or, or whenever it is. Or, you know what, they change course and they're going to a completely different town than you wanted them to go to. Pick up all of those NPCs and those characters and the inn itself. And guess what? They just found this inn over here. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. They can still get all the clues, all the little things that are going to advance the story that way. But they made that decision to go there. And it's not still railroading them. They may find some new information there too, but be flexible in your game mastering. And then my last really important thing is to, especially when you're playing with new players um, or a new group, is to target those who aren't getting a chance to participate. Sometimes you have shyer players at the table and you have like an alpha that wants to do everything and like make the decision to talk over everybody to say, oh yes, you know, the wizard emerges from the cave and he points at the insert person who hasn't been able to participate more and says, you there, you know, and then have them be the one that has to, it will bring them out and into the story. It will give them a chance to speak up when they've been afraid to interject. Anyway, um, I'm Elisa Teague. My website is alisateague.com and you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Geeky Pinup. Yay, thank you all so much for being here. I look forward to seeing everything you all are doing on the internet. As always, I'm at I'm Satine Phoenix at Satine Phoenix on pretty much everything. Come back here to twitch.tv slash wizards of the couch at 4 p.m. Central for my GM tips. It's a fireside chat with me. And with that, we are out. See you later. Happy Gary.